Chapter 3 Luke lay on his stomach on the floor and idly ran the toy train back and forth on the track. The train had belonged to Dad when he was a little boy and his own father before him. Luke could remember a time when his greatest longing had been for Mark to outgrow the train. So Luke could have it all to himself. But it wasn't what he wanted to play with today. It was a beautiful day unfolding outside, with fleecy clouds in the blue, blue sky, and a mild breeze rustling the grass in the backyard. He hadn't left the house in a week now, and now he wasn't even allowed to be in the same room with an uncovered window. Are you trying to be discovered? Dad had bellowed at Luke just that morning when he'd held the shade a few inches back from the kitchen window and peeked out longingly. Luke jumped. He'd been so busy thinking about running barefoot through the grass that he'd half forgotten there was anyone or anything behind him in the house. No one's out there, he said, glancing again to be sure. He'd been trying not to look beyond the ragged, ragged edge of the backyard to the bulldozed mess of the branches, trunks, leaves, and mud that had once been his beloved woods. Yeah, Dad said, did it ever occur to you that if there is, they might see you before you see them? He grabbed Luke by the arm and jerked him back a good three feet. Freed from Luke's grasp, the bottom of the shade banged against the windowsill. You can't look at all, Dad said. I mean it. From now on, just stay away from the windows, and don't go into the room unless we've got a shade or cur curtains pulled. But then I can't see anything, Luke protested. Better than better that than to get turned in, Dad said. Dad sounded like he might feel sorry for Luke, but that only made things worse. Luke turned around and left, scared he might cry in front of Dad. Now he gave the toy train a shove, and it careened off the track. It landed upside down, wheels spinning. Who cares, Luke muttered. There was a harsh knock on his door. Population police, open up. Luke didn't move. That's not funny, Mark, he shouted. Mark opened the door and bounded up the stairs that led to Luke's room proper. Luke's room was also in the attic, a fact that he had never minded. Mother long ago had shoved all the trunks and boxes as far as they could go under the eaves, leaving prime space for Luke's brass bed and circular rag rug and books and toys. Luke had even heard Matthew and Mark grumble that Luke was getting the biggest room, but they all had windows. Scared, scared you this time, didn't I? Mark said. No, Luke said. Nothing would force him to admit that his heart had jumped. Mark had been playing the population police joke for years, always out of their parents' earshot. Usually Luke just ignored Mark, but now, with Dad acting so skittish, what would Luke have done if it really had been the population police? What would they do to him? Matt and me, we've never told anyone about you, Mark said, suddenly serious, which was strange for him. And you know Mother and Dad don't say anything. You're good at hiding, so you're safe, you know? I know, Luke muttered. Mark kicked the toy train Luke had crashed, still playing with baby toys. He asked as if to make up for slipping and being nice. Luke shrugged. Normally, he wouldn't have wanted Mark to know he played with the train anymore. But today, everything else was so bad that it didn't matter. Did you come up here just to bug me? Luke asked. Mark put on an offended look. Thought you might want to play checkers, he said. Luke squinted. Mother told you to, right? He asked. No. You're lying, Luke said, not caring how nasty he sounded. Well, if you're going to be that way... Just leave me alone, okay? Okay, okay, Mark backed down the stairs. Jeez. Alone again, Luke felt a little sorry he'd been so mean. Maybe Mark had told the truth. Luke should apologize, but he didn't really feel like it. Luke got up and started pacing his room. The squeak of the third board in from the stairs annoyed him. He hated having to duck under the rafters on the far side of the bed. Even his favorite model cars lined up on the shelves in the corner bothered him today. Why should he have model cars? He never even sat in a real one. He would never would. He'd never get to do anything or go anywhere. He might as well just rot up here in the attic. He thought about that before, on the rare occasion when Mother, Dad, Matthew, and Mark all went somewhere and left him behind. What if something happened to them and they never came back? Would someone find him years from now, abandoned and dead? He'd read a story in one of the old books in the attic about a bunch of kids finding the desperate pirate ship and then a skeleton in one of the rooms He'd been, um, he'd be like that skeleton, and now he wasn't alone in the rooms with, 
and now that he wasn't allowed in the rooms with uncovered windows, he'd be a skeleton in the dark. Luke looked up automatically, as if to remind himself that nothing lit the rafters but the single bulb over his head, except there was a light at the end of the ceiling leaking in under the peak of the roof. Luke stood up and went to investigate. Of course, he should have remembered. There were vents at the end of the roof. Dad grumbled occasionally about heating the attic for Luke. It's just like throwing money out of those vents. But Mother always fixed him with one of her stairs and nothing changed. Now Luke climbed on top of one of the largest trunks and looked down through the vent and he could see out. He could see the strip of road and the cornfield beyond, its leaves waving in the breeze. The vent slanted down and limited his view, but at least he was sure nobody would ever be able to see him. For a moment, Luke was excited, but that quickly faded. He didn't want to spend the rest of his life watching the corn grow. Without much hope, he stepped down from the trunk and went to the other end of the attic, the portion that faced the backyard. He had to slide boxes around and drag an old step stool from the opposite end of the attic, but finally his eyes were level with the back vent. The view was not of the backyard. It was too close, but of the former woods. He'd never realized it before, but the land was sloped away from his family's house, so he had a clear view of acres and acres that once had been covered with trees. The land was abuzz with activity now. Huge yellow bulldozers shoved brush back from the rough road that had been traced out with gravel. Other vehicles Luke couldn't identify were digging holes for huge concrete pipes. Luke wash, watched in fascination. He knew tractors and combines, of course, and had his dad uh, and had seen his dad's bush, and had seen his dad's bush hog and manure spreader and gravity wagons up close in the barns. But these machines were different, designed for different jobs, and they were all operated by different people. Once, when Luke was younger, a tramp had walked up to the house, and Luke had only had time to hide under the sink in the mudroom before the man was in the house, begging for food. The door of the cabinet was cracked, so Luke had been able to peek out and see the man's patched trousers and holy shoes. He turned his whiny voice. I ain't got no job, and I ain't eaten three days. No, no, I can't do no framework for my food. What do you think I am? I'm sick. I'm starving. Other than that, tramp, and pictures and books... Luke had never seen another human being besides his parents and Matthew and Mark. He never dreamed there were such variety. Many of these people running the bulldozers and shuffle contraptions were stripped of their shirts while others were standing nearby even wore ties and coats. Some were fat and some were thin. Some were bar browned by the sun and there were others paler like Luke himself, who had never been tan again, who would never be tan again. They were all moving, shifting gears and lowering pipe waving the others into position, or at the very least, talking at full speed. All this activity made Luke dizzy. The pictures in the books always showed people still. Overwhelmed, Luke closed his eyes, then opened them, again the fear of missing something. Luke, reluctantly, Luke slid down from the stool, per the step stool perch and scrambled over to the recline innocently on his bed. Come in, he called for his mother. She climbed the stairs heavily. You okay? Luke dangled his feet over the side of the bed. Sure, I'm fine. Mother sat on the bed beside him and patted his leg. It's... She swallowed hard. It's not easy, the life you've got to live. I know you'd like to be outside. I know you'd like to look outside. That's okay, Mother, he said. He could have told her then about the vents. He didn't see how anyone could object to him looking out there. But something stopped him. What if that they took that away from him, too? What if mother told dad and dad said, no, no, that's too much of a risk. I forbid it. Luke wouldn't be able to stand it. He kept silent. Mother ruffled his hair. You're a trooper, she said. I knew you'd hold up all right. Luke leaned against his mother's arms and she moved her arm around his shoulder and hugged him tight to her. He felt a little guilty for keeping a secret, but mostly assured, loved and assured. Then more to herself than him, mother added, and things could be worse. Somehow, that wasn't comforting. Luke didn't know how, why, but he had a feeling that she really meant what uh, was that things were going to get worse. He snuggled tighter against his mother, hoping he was wrong. Chapter 4 Luke found out what mother meant a few days later when he came down for breakfast. As usual, he opened the door um, from the back stairs to the kitchen, only a crack. 
He could remember barely a handful of times in his entire life when someone had dropped by before breakfast, and each time Mother had managed to send Matthew and Mark up to warn Luke to stay out of sight, but he always checked. Today, he could see Dad and Matthew and Mark at the table and knew from the sound of frying bacon that Mother must be above the stove. All the shades closed, he called softly. Mother opened the door to the stairs. Luke started to step into the kitchen, but she put out her arm to keep him back. She handed him a plate full of scrambled eggs and bacon. Luke, honey, can you eat sitting at the bottom step there? What? Luke asked. Mother looked beseechingly over her shoulder. Dad thinks, I mean, it's not safe to have you in the kitchen. You can still eat with us and talk with us and all, but you'll be over here. She waved her hand toward the stairs behind Luke. But with all the shades pulled, Luke started. One of those workers asked me yesterday, Hey, farmer, you got air conditioning in that house of yours? Dad said from the table. He didn't turn around. He didn't seem to want to look at Luke. We keep the shades pulled. Hot day like today, people get suspicious. This way is safer. I'm sorry. And then Dad did turn around and glance at Luke once. Luke tried to keep him from looking upset. So what'd you tell him? Matthew said, as if to the worker's question was only a matter of curiosity. Told him, of course we don't have air conditioning. Farmers don't make nobody a millionaire. Dad took a long sip of coffee. Okay, Luke, Mother asked. Yes, he mumbled. He took the plate of bacon and, uh, okay, Luke, Mother asked. Yes, he mumbled. He took the plate of bacon and eggs and it didn't look good to him now. He knew every bite he ate would stick um, in his throat. He sat down on the step out of sight of both window kitchen, both kitchen windows. We'll leave the door open, Mother said. She hovered over him as if will, unwilling to return to the stove. This isn't too much different, is it? Mother, Dad said warningly. Through the open windows, Luke could hear the rumble of several trucks and cars. The workers had arrived for the day. He knew from watching through the vent the past few days that the caravan of vehicles came up the road like a parade. The cars would peel off the side and unload a nice-dressed man. The more rugged vehicles pulled on into the muddiest sections, and the people inside would scatter to the bulldozers and backhoes that had been left outside overnight. But the vehicles barely had time to get cold because the workers were there now from sunup to sundown. Someone was in a hurry for them to finish. Luke, I'm sorry, Mother said, and scurried back to the stove. She loaded a plate for herself, then sat down at the table beside Luke's usual spot. His chair wasn't even in the kitchen anymore. For a while, Luke watched Dad, Mother, Matthew, and Mark eating in silence, a complete family of four. Once he cleared his throat, ready to protest again. You can't do this. It's not fair. Then he choked back the words, unspoken. They were only trying to protect him. What can he do? Resolutely, Luke stuck his fork in the pile of scrambled eggs on his plate and took a bite. He ate the whole plateful of food without tasting any of it.